Okay. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this panel today of paper session four. I think it dovetails nicely off of uh, paper session three, and we can keep this important discussion about menthol bans and flavor bans um, going and focused on racial and ethnic minorities uh, a little bit more. Um, so let me just give a brief overview. Uh, I'm Dustin Lee. I'm an assistant professor at um, Johns Hopkins Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit. Um, I, my area of interest is the intersection of cannabis and tobacco, and I'm also a site investigator on the Vermont T Corps grant. Um, so today, uh, just, oh, I'm sorry, just to, to get the session logistics out of the way, um, in case um, any of you haven't seen them so far, uh, the chat function is live uh, for attendees to introduce themselves to one another. Um, and each speaker will present, and then we'll have a Q&A discussion after both speakers have uh, presented. Uh, please share your questions in the Q&A section at any time. If you don't share your questions in the Q&A section, then I have to ask the questions, and I assure you, your questions will be better than mine. Uh, questions in the chat won't be shared with our speakers. They will be uh, in the Q&A. And this session is being recorded. Um, and will be posted to our website and YouTube channel for on-demand viewing following our conference. So with that out of the way, um, we have two uh, very good speakers today, uh, Shanika, Dr. Shanika Rose, um, and I'll introduce Dr. Rose first. Uh, Shanika Rose is an assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Science at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine and the Center for Health Equity Transformation. Um, prior to her position at UK, Dr. Rose was a director at the Truth uh, Initiative Schroeder Institute conducting tobacco-related policy research. Her research focuses broadly on the mechanisms by which policy initiatives can influence tobacco initiation and cessation, and how policy can contribute to the reduction or widening of racial, and ethnic, and socioeconomic health disparities. Um, so today, Dr. Rose is going to be speaking on potential impacts of menthol ban on cigarette smoking in disadvantaged and racial ethnic minority populations. Dr. Rose, take it away. Okay. Give me one second to get my screens uh, working. So can you can you see that? Yes, looks good. Okay, perfect. All right. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to continue the the you know the very interesting discussion um, that was had uh, this morning as well, and talk a little bit more um, specifically on the uh, potential equity impl impacts of menthol bans. So here are my disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so. You know, why do we care about menthol cigarettes? I'm sure everyone here kind of knows this, but menthol cigarette use is an important issue because using menthol cigarettes appear to be different than using non-menthol cigarettes in several important ways. So menthol is a chemical added to cigarettes uh, to mask the harshness of tobacco and make it more palatable, especially for youth. It also provides a cooling sensation that can make uh, cigarettes easier to use. Um, Menthol use has been associated with tobacco initiation and progression to regular use um, compared with non-menthol cigarettes. And adult menthol smokers are less likely than non-menthol smokers to successfully quit smoking. And that's despite increased quit intentions and quit attempts. So to dig in a little bit more um, with more recent data, um, in 2018, menthol cigarettes comprised about 36% of the U.S. cigarette market. But while overall use cigarette use has come down substantially, menthol cigarette prevalence now exceeds non-menthol cigarette prevalence in youth and young adult populations who smoke. Um, so data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey find that from 2016 to 2018, um, higher proportions of youth menthol smokers smoked on more days per month, smoked more cigarettes per day, uh, we're more likely to smoke 100 cigarettes lifetime, smoked cigars and hookah, and use flavored non-cigarette tobacco products. So among these youth who use menthol cigarettes, there was a higher intensity and frequency of youth, more established use, and more poly-tobacco use. Um, 
Additionally, in some newer studies um, on mental use and cessation, um, probably these are covered a bit this morning as well, but a meta-analysis by Smith and, and, and colleagues find, found that overall there was no difference in cessation between menthol and non-menthol smokers, but there was a 12% lower odds of smoking cessation for um, African-American menthol versus non-menthol users. And um, Mills et al. In, a, in their study across four waves of the PATH study kind of dig into this a little bit more and find uh, additionally that while there were no differences in cessation for non-daily menthol versus um, non-daily -men non non-menthol smokers, that there were lower odds uh, for daily menthol uh, users and even greater uh, lower odds of cessation among uh, African-American daily menthol smokers. Uh, additionally, um, across a broad range of studies, menthol use compared with non-menthol use is more prevalent across a variety of vulnerable populations, including youth and young adults, um, females, including pregnant smokers, um, communities of color, low SES and education, um, those, uh, those populations with those characteristics, uh, sexual and gender minority uh, populations, um, and those with mental health comorbidities. So uh, quite a lot of disparities with menthol use. And just to dig in a little bit deeper related to menthol um, cigarettes and racial ethnic um, populations, uh, Andrea Valenti and colleagues found that um, in the National Survey on Drug Use and Health data, that menthol cigarette use was higher among Hispanic, Asian, and African-American smokers compared with uh, white populations that smoked. And notably, menthol use was over 80% among African-American smokers, which is not probably something that's new to this population, um, uh, to this audience. But you know, along with that, um, another study that uh, Amy Cohn and I and, and others did uh, using PATH data echoed that finding, finding that African-American smokers had 22 times the odds of using a menthol versus a non-menthol cigarette compared with white smokers. And also that African-American um, smokers comprised 31% of all adults who smoked menthol cigarettes in the US uh, at that time, despite comprising only 12 to 13% of the US population. Um, Additionally, um, this is a very recent paper uh, in tobacco control by Mendez and Lee, finds that menthol cigarettes have really caused excess harm to uh, Black populations in the US. And menthol smoking was attributed to 1.5 million additional people initiating smoking. This is since uh, 1980. Um, 156,000 additional deaths and 1.5 million life years lost. And this menthol burden has been disproportionately borne by African-Americans who are only 12% of the population, but comprise 15% of excess initiators, 41% of the excess deaths and 50% of ex uh, excess uh, life years lost. Um, and so, you know, what is going on there? And so tobacco industry practices, as we know, are a key factor in shaping tobacco use disparities and the use of menthol specifically. Um, menthol cigarettes have been heavily promoted in a to a variety of audiences over time. And menthol marketing is more prevalent uh, in retail stores, in neighborhoods, uh, there are more re retail stores with menthol marketing. Um, in neighborhoods with more African-American and low-income residents. And it's also more cheaply priced in those neighborhoods and has more sales and promotions as well. So all of the strategies are you know, combining to kind of litter some communities with menthol and others uh, with very little. So giving a little bit of a, a, a brief history of menthol ban policies, uh, just to kind of take from an equity perspective, let me take you back um, very briefly, and I'm sure some of this was discussed in, the, in earlier as well. But um, in 2009, the Tobacco Control Act passed uh, 
banning flavored cigarettes, but exempting, specifically exempting menthol. Um, and in the act, there was a call that, um, that FDA needed to uh, set up a tobacco products scientific advisory committee to, to look more deeply at menthol. And so that, the, the TIPSAC menthol report uh, was issued in 2011. So this is uh, over 10 years ago now. Um, saying that the removal of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace would benefit public health in the United States. Um, due to some industry um, lawsuits, the FDA ended up conducting their own um, report and their scientific evaluation report was issued in 2013, um, which found that at, even at that time, the weight of the evidence supports the conclusion that menthol cigarettes are likely associated with increased initiation and progression to regular cigarette smoking, increased dependence, and reduced success in smoking cessation, especially among African American menthol smokers. So this is um, so that equity uh, disparity there is, um, you know, was clearly stated in that report, but. You know, go, fast forwarding. Um, you know, so in that in that ten year period, um, states and localities were were taking up the mantle and they were passing local policies. So states and localities were filling that gap um, by enacting local sales restrictions on flavored products. So Truth Initiative tracks these policies and currently finds that there are three hundred and thirty six localities with a local or state flavor policy can covering about 19% uh, of the US population. Um, so there's been fairly rapid growth of these policies over time. There are two states, uh, Massachusetts and California that have a flavor, a statewide flavor restriction that's been enacted that include menthol cigarettes. Um, Massachusetts's menthol ban is in effect at this point, but California's is held up um, because of litigation. Um, so large parts of the country, as you see, um, the, the map's not completely up to date, but uh, do not have any flavor policies. And some localities may be restricted from enacting such policies, including my own, due to preemption at the state level. Um, so this leads to kind of a very uneven patchwork. Um, and so uh, the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council you know, and other um, public health groups sued the FDA to get them to act on menthol. And um, through that lawsuit, uh, FDA made the announcement earlier this year that they would move to ban menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. And in their announcement itself, they specifically call out the effect that these policies will have not only in saving lives, but um, that they will do so particularly among those who are disproportionately affected by these deadly products. Um, and that, that these policies will address health disparities experienced by communities of color, low income populations, and LGBTQ uh, plus individuals, all of whom are, as we noted earlier, are disproportionately more likely to use these, these products. Um, and so, you know, a couple of other studies help to suggest what might happen um, from an equity perspective related to these um, to these bans. And so, you heard more about this this morning. But um, a 2011 modeling study by Levy uh, and colleagues found that if menthol had been banned, then um, it would have decreased smoking prevalence by 9.7 percent. And uh, among African Americans, it would be almost a quarter. Um, deaths averted would be 633,000 um, by 2050, and 37% of those lives saved would be among African American people who smoke. Um, they have updated this, you know, uh, this this analysis in 20 uh, 20 recently uh, this year, and that if the ban were implemented you know, today, um, that smoking prevalence would decrease uh, even more by 15%. And this, this analysis also takes into account um, 
the presence of nicotine vaping products, which the prior analysis did not um, on the market, it, it would uh, potentially avert even more deaths. And they didn't specifically model the um, effect for African-American populations, but they suggest that these effects would be even larger. So um, Dr. Valerie Yerger, um, you know, very powerfully makes the case that really uh, makes a case for equity impacts of a menthol ban and that no more evidence is needed for FDA to remove menthol from the market. And I think we've really seen that um, through everything that's been done. And so, um, and also that such a policy is likely to have an impact in reducing disparities. And I, and I, and I agree. Um, I don't think we need more studies showing the harms of menthol or why a ban could be beneficial for uh, public health and for health equity. Instead, I wanna use my remaining time to, um, to talk about what we need to be attentive to to ensure that a menthol ban has a strong impact in um, creating those health equity effects. So what do I mean by um, you know, looking at uh, policies through an equity lens? And so for me as a public health and health equity researcher, it's not sufficient to just justify menthol bans as a policy that can potentially reduce disparities. We need to really think about what that means and how does that happen? And as we think about policy adoption enactment and implementation, we need to consider the equity implications of menthol bans um, and what that means in, in practice. Um, so policies can affect population prevalence um, and bring down smoking rates overall without affecting less advantaged groups who have experienced the greatest harms for menthol. Um, if policies, uh, predominantly affect more advantaged groups, then we have the unintended consequence of increasing disparities. Um, what we really want to have when we think about having an equity lens on these policies is having a greater effect on groups with less advantage who have been historically, um, who have borne the brunt of menthol, so that we reduce tobacco use disparities and ameliorate the inequitable, unfair, and frankly racist impacts that menthol cigarettes continue to have. And so um, centering these populations and these questions need to be embedded within all aspects of the policy process in order to ensure equitable impact. So we can all point to examples of policies that either by design or by lack of, um, uh, you know, lack of attention to equity can end up having inequitable effect, impacts. And we've seen this starkly demonstrated throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Even policies that work equally may not work equitably. Um, and we really need to be attentive to that. To ensure equitable impact, we need to be attentive to equity issues at all phases of the policy process, from selection of policy to how policies are formulated, how, where, and why they are implemented or, uh, uh, sorry, they are adopted or not adopted, how they are implemented, um, and finally, how they are enforced. Um, assuming a national menthol ban within a federal system, we need to also examine federal policy impacts, but we need to place that in the context of uh, the state and local policies that are in effect. And of course, within the tobacco context, we always need to be attentive to tobacco industry tactics, alternative products, and um, potential responses seeking to water down policy impact. So several of my studies focus on these questions and I'll briefly walk through some highlights of a few of them. So, okay, so first when we talk about um, policy selection, here we're specifically talking in this presentation about menthol bans, but you see how the stage was set for this policy due to the deliberate exclusion of menthol in the ban on flavored cigarettes 10 years ago. Um, so when we examine specific flavor types used by the past 30 day flavored tobacco users in wave two of the past study across age groups, you'll see that um, when you look at mental, uh, when you look at flavors used, um, that all these other flavors that were banned um, are reported at very, very low levels and menthol cigarette use is still um, quite high. Um, 
But when you look at all of these other products, any tobacco products that are where there are really no um, restrictions on flavors that are available, you see that all of these um, flavors are um, quite heavily used across age groups and that, um, and that, uh, that menthol is also still you know, quite high. Menthol use is quite high. So when we, we didn't in the study specifically focuses on differences in use across subpopulations, but menthol users, menthol cigarette users compared with other flavored cigarette users were clearly left behind in any potential impacts of the flavored cigarette ban. And future policy selection needs to be attentive to what products and flavors are remaining on the market when menthol is eventually removed. And I'm gonna say when just to be um, optimistic. Um, all right. So how policies are formulated also has a big impact on how equitable they are. Um, so one thing that comes up repeatedly in local policies is whether or not to allow retailer type exemptions where sales of flavored products are still allowed. We conducted a study to examine how much retail availability, availability of flavored product tobacco uh, with Barb Shillow would remain under a hypothetical national policy that allowed flavored tobacco sales in tobacco specialty outlets, the tobacco stores, and one that allowed tobacco sales in tobacco specialty outlets and alcohol outlets, so like liquor stores. Both policies would significantly reduce the availability of flavored tobacco nationally from a current status quo of no sales restrictions. But in large metro area compared with the national average, flavored tobacco availability would remain 47 to 49% higher for all racial ethnic groups, leading potentially to geographic disparities. And more comprehensive policies without retailer exemptions would most equitably reduce flavored tobacco availability, especially for urban and racial ethnic minority populations who tend to live in those areas. So another issue where equity um, issues, can, another area where equity issues can emerge is in what types of policies are enacted and where they are enacted. So another study that we conducted um, in 2018, where we focused on where had local flavor policies been implemented and examined the characteristics of the populations in those localities compared with the US as a whole to examine whether policies were reaching various groups at at least comparable to their overall share of the population. We linked all flavor policies in the blue um, color, which is I know a little hard to see in this graphic, so I apologize, um, that included uh, more comprehensive policies, including menthol cigarettes, and those in the pink that didn't include menthol cigarettes. We calculated uh, reach ratios, and those with confidence intervals above one suggest that these types of policies are reaching those populations that are above their population prevalence, who had favorable reach equity, and those below are reaching those populations at lower than their population prevalence, so had unfavorable reach equity. So looking, we looked at in that paper at a variety of population subgroups that have typically used flavored tobacco at higher rates, but here I'm focusing on the racial ethnic uh, group findings. So any flavor policies did have favorable reach at that time um, to African-American, Asian, and Hispanic populations. However, the strongest policies, which included menthol cigarettes, had unfavorable equity, reach equity to African-American, Hispanic, and um, American Indian, Alaska Native populations. So we really need to think about where these populations are, uh, you know, where these policies are being uh, enacted and are they actually protecting the population as a whole, which is where national policies can be very helpful. So another thing that's important is when you think about implementation of menthol bans, how individuals who smoke menthol cigarettes respond is really important, right? So the biggest policy impacts are dependent on people uh, quitting tobacco completely or switching completely uh, potentially to lower harm products that are not overall increasing their harms of tobacco use. So in a national study of young adults, um, we examine what people who smoke menthol said they would do across eight waves of data. And in the average response, almost a third said they would switch to non-menthol, which would potentially not reduce harm, but could help them um, you know, quit potentially based on Dr. Um, Kotler's um, presentation this morning. About a quarter said that they would quit entirely and 11% said that they would switch to some other product, which may or may not have 
uh, beneficial impact, depending on what products they switch to and whether they switch completely. And about 30% did not know what they would do, which might be a potentially persuadable audience. Um, in adjusted analyses, African-Americans, women, those with less than a high school education, and those with any quit uh, intention were more likely to say they would quit smoking entirely, which would suggest potentially having a, a stronger effect for those groups. Um, and this is a study that we did that I haven't published yet, but um, it's also getting at equity concerns in that we examined this question among a predominantly African-American adult sample of menthol um, cigarette smokers in Washington, DC. And in this sample, individuals could pick more than one response. And we found that about the same quarter said that they would quit entirely, but 43% thought that they would either quit entirely or smoke less, um, potentially giving them a way to uh, quit over time. And then only 13, uh, sorry, only 16% said they would switch to non-menthol cigarettes. Um, while 27% said that they would continue to get menthol somehow. 13% um, thought that they would switch to some other type of product, while 21% really didn't know. Um, but importantly, about a third said that they would have some type of emotional response to a menthol ban, including um, being angry or missing their usual brand. And so this suggests that while menthol bans might provide an opportunity um, for uh, equity impact and for quitting smoking among African-American individuals who smoke, um, by helping them quit, switch, or, use, or reduce use by providing, we need to also provide cessation resources, culturally appropriate mass uh, media messaging to shift norms and individual decisional balance. Uh, we need to continue to examine alternative sources of menthol cigarettes in communities after a menthol ban and we need to see what, uh, what alternative sources, what uh, alternative products are available um, and what people are interested in. And this will all be easier in the context of a federal rather than local policies where menthol cigarettes can be accessible in nearby jurisdictions. So um, finally, uh, we are additionally going to be looking at actual equity impacts of existing uh, policies in local communities across the US in a new R01 study that I, we started this year. And the um, overarching goal of this study is to determine the impact of local flavor policies um, on uh, reducing exposure to uh, menthol and flavored tobacco marketing and on use of flavored uh, and menthol tobacco among vulnerable um, emerging youth and young adults. And we have a preliminary paper um, on this under review, and hopefully we'll be presenting some of these results at SRT in February. So I won't go into that here, but please stay tuned. So just overall, um, when we think about uh, menthol bans and equity, I think it's important to realize that while equity impacts are likely due to disparate use of menthol among racial, ethnic, and disadvantaged populations, um, this is not a guarantee, and we need to be really attentive to how policies are structured, federal policy or local policies, and how they will work. So um, comprehensive policies are more likely to have an equitable impact um, than those with significant product or retailer exemptions, um, and how those product policies are structured will also impact uh, equity. So what substitutes are available and desired in communities? Um, how harmful are they, um, if, if that even means anything related to um, what policies, you know, other things that are going on in people's lives? Where and to whom are menthol cigarettes still available? Um, what kinds of, uh, and how will these policies be enforced? Um, and then also, we also need to be very attentive to changes and responses by the tobacco industry, what new products might come onto the market, uh, what kinds of legislative or legal challenges will be put into place, and just how are they going to respond um, to these policies. Um, we really need to know how uh, particular groups of menthol 
use, uh, cigarette smokers will respond to these policies, what they care about, and um, what they, you know, what, what messages they're hearing. And we need to be attentive to geographic differences, especially because for some communities, a national menthol ban will be all that, that they have. And in other communities, they'll have much broader, um, stronger policies uh, across a variety of products. And so um, uh, finally, we need to be very attentive to what cessation resources are available and make sure that as menthol bans, especially a federal ban, go into effect, that cessation resources are available, that they're culturally appropriate, and that they are reaching um, the populations that have most been harmed by menthol. So that's all I got. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Uh, that was a really great uh, talk. And I really like how you uh, set the stage and formulated a comprehensive overview of the equitable impact, equitable impact on the menthol, potential menthol ban, uh, many different aspects of it. Uh, I think that really provides good structure for discussion. Um, so moving right along, we have a shorter session. I want to uh, introduce Dr. Julia Chen Sankey. Um, Dr. Sankey is an assistant professor at the Center for Tobacco Studies at the School of Public Health at Rutgers. Uh, prior to coming to Rutgers, she received her master's of public policy in 2012 from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and her PhD um, from University of Maryland School of Public Health in 2018. Uh, her research broadly involves investigating the influence of flavored tobacco use and tobacco marketing among youth and young adults, as well as cigar use disparities among racial and ethnic minority populations. Um, so Dr. Sankey is gonna to talk today about hypothetical impacts of flavored cigar sales restrictions on cigar use behavior. Uh, please take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Dustin. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that well? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am Julia Chinsenki. I'm currently Assistant Professor at Rogers Center for Tobacco Studies. Um, I, today I want to use this opportunity to kind of introduce um, two of my recent studies um, related to hypothetical impacts of flavor cigar sales restrictions on cigar use behavior. And I thank Dr. Higgins for the warm um, invitation to present my studies during this conference. So just uh, beginning with acknowledgments, I want to thank my co-authors and uh, my collaborators um, for those studies. And then the studies are funded by NMHD Coleman Awards in NMHD Intramural Research Program. Um, and I'm currently supported by the Pathway to Independence Award in TRS from NCI FDA and also Rogers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. So just a disclaimer, the content um, of the studies is solely the responsibility of the authors and does not represent the official views of NCI, NMHD, or FDA. The authors have no conflict of interest to declare. So quickly, the presentation outline, I will introduce background and significance of flavor cigar sales restrictions and introduce two studies. The first one is in-depth interview study among a sample of Black young adult cigar smokers. Study two is using online survey um, of a nationally representative sample of adult flavored cigar smokers. And I will uh, following, uh, follow the discussion on uh, future directions and limitations of the study. So I think the audience of this uh, conference is very familiar with cigar use. So I'm not gonna uh, talk more about the harm of cigars, but cigars um, are combust, combust, sorry, combustible tobacco, just like cigarettes. And there are man, many types of cigar products currently available in the US market, such as traditional large cigars, premium cigars, cigarillos, and filter cigars. 
So I just want to highlight um, the, the racial ethnic disparities that we are observing of cigar smoking in the country right now. This paper we published in AJPM this year really highlighted the fact that even after controlling all the non-risk factors of cigar smoking, we're still seeing this racial ethnic disparities um, in terms of past 30 day smoking, daily smoking, and asplish smoking. And the disparities are even more pronounced for cigarillo smoking than uh, um, other types of cigar smoking. Um, and then also the disparities was, was observed uh, among youth. Um, so in 2020, non-Hispanic Black high school students reported uh, twice of the smoking cigar smoking problems than their white counterparts. And I just want to kind of um, highlight the fact that for blunt smoking, which is using uh, marijuana or cannabis in cigar products, um, the prevalence is pretty high. So uh, the national data show that among current adult cigar smokers in the US, 45% of this population actually used cigars to smoke blunts um, in the past 30 days. And for um, non-Hispanic Black or African-American adult population cigar smokers, the percentage is close to 60%. So when we're talking about cigars, um, we have to kind of consider what they're using cigars for. Um, and about half of the current smokers actually use um, blunts. So why flavors? I'm sure the audience is very familiar with flavors. Um, over half of cigar sales volume and over half of current cigar smokers smoke flavored cigar products. Um, and if you're using one of the published studies we have working with Dr. Aaron Meet Morris in, two years ago using ecological momentary assessment, we actually found among African-American young adult cigar smokers, the past two week flavor cigars was as high as 98%. So if you're using EMA study versus a past 30 day recall study, the prevalence of flavor cigars are much higher. And of course, we all know that flavors contribute to tobacco initiation, regular use, long-term use, and tobacco dependence. And um, flavors were also disproportionately marketed to low SES populations and racial ethnic minority populations and communities. And um, therefore, in April 2021, the FDA announced a plan to restrict the sales of cigar products with all categorizing flavors, including menthol, specifically highlighting in the announcement that the plan is to reduce, partially to reduce um, health, health disparities among minority um, populations. So the study one um, we did was in-depth interview study among black young adult cigar smokers with 40 um, of them. Um, and then the, the goal was to really understanding the policy and the environmental risk factors for cigar smoking among black uh, young adult smokers. And then the, the population was uh, between 21 and 29 years and then self-reported non-Hispanic black or African-American and they smoked any cigar products um, four times or more than four times in the past two weeks. So they're pretty frequent and regular smokers. And the participant, were, the data were recruited between May and June 2020, 2020, sorry, it was last year, sorry about the typo. Um, participants were recruited through social media platform. Um, and the majority of the participants were from the DC, Washington DC area. So during the data collection period, there was no tobacco flavor ban. Um, the, masters, the masters including an online background survey and a 50 minute phone interview. Um, so the key question we asked the participants was that um, the participant Sorry, the interviewer first introduced a hypothetical scenario where the sale of non-tobacco flavored cigar products was restricted and only tobacco flavored or plain cigars were available to purchase. Um, the interviewer then asked the participants to discuss how they would smoke cigar products given this, this scenario. So is it gonna be the same um, way, frequency or amount of smoking or is it gonna be different? Um, and then interview data were coded independently by three coders, a somatic analysis was conducted. So just quick uh, participant characteristics. Um, participant main age was 26, so all young adult participants. And I was just gonna kind of orient you towards the most frequent type of cigars used in the past 30 days. Um, the leading 
type was blunts, uh, followed by cigarillos and large cigars and filter cigars. So, not a lot of them were uh, major, um, not not a lot of them were most frequently smoking large cigars or filter cigars. It was mainly blunts or cigarillos. Um, so the results, according to our coded qualitative results, as you can see from this uh, figure, among all participants, which is 40, um, over slightly over half of them said they will smoke the same way, which means that they will, you know, use plain cigars or non-tobacco flavored cigars, but smoke it in the same frequency or amount, um, given the flavor band. And then 35% said they will stop or reduce cigar smoking, and then about 12% said they were not sure what to do given the flavor ban. And among blunt smokers, um, smoke the same way percentage was higher, um, and then stop or reduce smoking was much lower than the overall participants. And for the cigarillo smokers, it was comparable to the overall participants, about 50% said they would smoke the same way, and close to 40% said they would stop or reduce smoking uh, cigars. We have very limited quality data from large cigar smokers and filter cigar smokers. So we didn't really um, kind of look into the data very substantially because of limited um, quotes and data. So just the main themes from this qualitative research is that about half of participants said they would smoke cigars the same way. Um, mainly because many of them said they smoke cigars mainly to consume cannabis, not the cigars itself. And this is from most of the blunt smokers. Um, some of them reported that they're willing to try or continue to smoke plain cigars or cigars without any flavors because they enjoy the taste of plain cigars. Um, and then some of them reported that they are addicted to cigar products and then they have a hard time giving up cigars. So they will not, um, uh, stop smoking cigars, even there, is, there are no flavors. Um, a few participants reported that they really enjoyed the feelings and the stress relief from smoking cigars, so they they would not stop smoking given the flavor ban. And lastly, a few participants talk about several creative ways of adding flavors into their plain cigar products, uh, such as adding honey syrup, just to add certain flavors. Um, they call them homemade flavors. Um, and then about a third of participants reported that they would stop or reduce cigar smoking because of the flavor ban. And then this is uh, mostly from cigarillo smokers who uh, frequently report that they have a strong preference towards flavor cigars or really enjoy cigar flavors. And the flavors are an important reason for them to smoke cigars. And for large cigar smokers, a few, like, a few of them reported that it might be too boring to smoke an entire large cigar without any flavors because flavors are already part of the experience of, of enjoying this large cigar. Um, and we also find several other unintended consequences, such as um, some participants talked about transition to smoke blunts or cannabis or smoke more blunts or cannabis if they're already using them. Um, and then also a few talked about smoke more cig cigarettes, and this is mostly from um, cigarillo smokers. So for those who were unsure of what to do, 10%, um, about 13%, they were not sure what to do because they don't know what plain cigars might taste like because they never had plain cigar, uh, smoked plain cigars before, but they would like to try. Um, and some of them depend, said that they, it depends on whether they would still be able to access flavored cigars, such as from online sources or other places, um, such as going across the border. So the discussion uh, that we got from this study is that we find how Black young adult cigar smokers may change their cigar smoking behavior really depends on the product the cigar product type they predominantly smoke, such as cigarillos or blunts, the subjective outcome expectancies of smoking cigars, such as relieving stress, and then their preferences towards flavored versus plain cigars, and then the perceived addiction to smoking cigars. So we find that those who reported cigar addiction had more positive outcome expectancies from smoking cigars or strongly preferred flavors, those are the subgroups that may be least likely to quit or reduce cigar smoking given the flavor ban. 
Um, we also no noticed uh, several unintended consequences reported by our participants, such as increased blunt or cannabis use, increased cigarette smoking, and of course, homemade or self-made flavors potentially added to plain cigars, and also shift to purchase cigars online or other sources. So that was study one. And quickly, um, study two, we uh, recently um, did this online survey among a nationally representative sample of adult flavor cigar smokers. Um, the data was collected through Quatrix, Quatrix online study panel, January to February, 2021. And then the overall sample was among recent former tobacco users and current tobacco users adults 21 years and over. We oversampled now Hispanic Blacks and Asians. Um, this, this particular study was restricted to the sample of current cigar smokers who use non-tobacco flavors. So the sample size was 343. And then the res research question we were really interested in was that what are the predictors of cigar smoking behavior change in response to flavor cigar sales restrictions. And then the statistical analysis method that is that we weighted all of our data to represent national, a national sample, and then we used a univariate logistic regression. And then the question, the key question um, in the sample uh, sorry, in a survey and I'm presenting today is that if the sales of flavored cigar products that taste like fruits, alcohol, candy, menthol, meats, and desserts were banned, what would you do? So participants first, uh, lead, first will choose, I would stop smoking cigars altogether. And if this, um, if this option was selected, they were unable to choose or select other options, um, which are, I would smoke plain cigars without any flavors. I would substitute flavor cigars with other flavored tobacco products. I would substitute flavor cigars with cannabis. I would substitute flavor cigars with other tobacco. Oh, sorry, with other products not, not stated above. And then if the participant choose, I would substitute flavored cigars with other flavored tobacco products, they will then choose from a list of specific flavored tobacco products they, were, they would um, replace um, cigars from, including cigarettes, e-cigarettes, hookah, and smokers tobacco. So the results very quickly, um, the weighted percentages of our sample, ha, uh, as you can see from those um, cigar smokers, close to 72% of our cigar smokers were smoking blunts currently. Uh, again, this is a national representative sample. Um, and then 60% were smoking cigarillos. Um, sorry. Um, and then 28% filter cigars, 27% um, large cigars. And if you're looking at the left column, the overall percentage, that's the potential cigar behavior change outcomes. 15% of our overall sample said they will quit cigars altogether. 42% uh, said they will smoke plain cigars without any flavors. Close to 40% said they, will, they would substitute flavored cigars with other flavored products such as 18% um, said they would smoke, uh, sorry, use flavor e-cigarettes followed by menthol cigarettes um, and flavor hookah. And about 30% said they would substitute flavor cigars with cannabis. Um, and then if you look at the percentage of quitting altogether among different uh, use, types of users, 18%, um, 11% of filter cigar and cigarillo smokers said they will quit altogether um, versus only um, slightly lower blonde smokers, 10, 11%, 8% large smokers. Um, and if you look at logistical regression results, um, the, the highlighted ones were significant. You can see a current large cigar smokers and the current lung smokers were less likely to quit cigars given the flavor ban. And here are some other significant results I'm highlighting here, including large cigar smokers may transition or replace flavored cigars with menthol cigarettes, flavored smokeless tobacco, filter cigar smokers will replace flavored cigars with smokeless, flavored smokeless tobacco. And um, in terms of transitioning or replacing flavored cigars with cannabis, 
you can see filter cigar smokers and blunt smokers were more likely to use more cannabis um, given the flavor band. And I want to highlight that because we also look at demographic differences of those cigar smoking change outcomes. We found that the only significant findings were non-Hispanic Black and Hispanics um, were more likely to report they might use more cannabis um, given the flavor band than non-Hispanic white young, sorry, white adults, and also young adults uh, aged, sorry, this is uh, 21 to 30, um, were more likely to report uh, replacing flavor cigars with cannabis than older adults. So those are the only demographic differences we found uh, when looking at those cigar change outcomes. And a discussion for this study is that according to our sample, which is we only have 343, but it is a national representative sample. We find that cigarillo and filter cigar smokers may be most likely to quit smoking um, in response to flavor cigar sales restrictions, while large cigar and blunt smokers may be least likely to quit smoking. Um, and then Looking at the overall sample, about 15% will quit cigars altogether, 40% would try or continue to use plain cigars, and the unintended consequences, including 40% would substitute flavor cigars with other flavored tobacco, and 30% would substitute flavor cigars with cannabis. And I, you know, I, like I just highlighted, there are higher racial ethnic minorities. Um, and young adult you use my transitioning or started to use more cannabis given the flavor of cigar um, ban. The future directions based on the studies that I just presented, um, the types of cigar smoked flavor pref preference, cigar smoking outcome expectancy such as stress relief and a perceived cigar addiction may determine cigar smoking behavior change outcomes given the flavor ban. I think those key variables or measures can be used to predict um, the outcome, policy outcome, or uh, can be key um, variables to think about who might be able to quit cigars given the flavor ban. And then we also want to highlight that flavor cigar sales restrictions may need to be accompanied by reducing the appeal of plain cigar products because uh, many of our participants were talking about how plain cigar stew um, is very appealing to them and it tastes pretty well. And evidence-based cigar smoking cessation efforts, which are very limited currently, need to go with sales restrictions, flavor sales restrictions. Um, and the reg regulations education about the use of other flavored tobacco products also need to go hand in hand with flavor ban. And lastly, cannabis related regulations education um, also um, need to go hand in hand, especially with cannabis based on some of our results where there's a concerns about health equity among uh, racial and ethnic minority populations. And lastly, um, I think it's very valuable for us to use some of the qualitative methods and mixed methods um, to really look at and understand the influence of flavored tobacco sales restrictions. Some of the study limitations, I wanna highlight data collection for both studies took place during COVID-19. This may have, you know, this might result in different cigar use patterns due to cigar accessibility and heightened stress and cannabis use. Um, and we did not separate out premium cigars from large machine-made cigars during our um, data collection participant eligibility criteria. Um, by excluding premium cigars from our analysis and data collection, we might see more quitting otherwise uh, because premium cigars are not flavored. Um, the studies did not evaluate the real world impacts of the flavor cigar sales restrictions. So we did not look at real world behavior change because the, the real world impact might really heavily depend on policy compliance and enforcement. And especially some of our former pre uh, presenters talked about concept flavors and how it is super difficult to um, enforce such flavor ban. And then there's also depend on, on, on the online access of flavor cigars. So yeah, that's all my presentation and I'll welcome any questions and comments. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Sinking. That was great. Um, you know, personal from personal uh, 
experience in recruiting cannabis users in Baltimore, the blunt use is is a big uh, issue um, in you know in in and increases in can potential increases in cannabis use, especially, um, is should be considered in any sort of flavored cigar bin. Um, so we have a couple questions coming in so far. So I guess we can get started there. Um, and uh, please, for the rest of the participants, if you do have questions, it's still live. So please do um, enter your questions into the chat or into the chat or the Q and A. Um, so the first question is regarding Julia's study. Um, the intentions to switch to smokeless tobacco are interesting. Um, the question here, is this a common self-reported response or something other studies have also shown? And is there any evidence that this happens in response to combustible restrictions? Um, so my understanding of the question is first about transitioning or replacing flavor cigars with smokeless tobacco. Um, we did find that kind of um, associations for large cigar smokers um, and filter cigar smokers. Um, the percentage was pretty low, though. It was only 5% of our sample actually reported they might switch to flavor, to flavor smokeless tobacco. So... I think it was a larger sample. We might be able to tell more um, about who might be switching to smokeless tobacco, but I think it's interesting how um, certain type of cigar smokers are more likely to use smokeless tobacco given the flavor of Um, And then ac according to the flavors, tobacco products that potentially participants will be switching to, the highest percentage report is actually um, flavorless e-cigarettes, it was 18% of our sample followed by menthol cigarettes. So um, I think one reason probably is for those who will replace flavor cigars with other type of tobacco, um, flavor e-cigarettes really offer um, many different flavors for them to choose from. So that might, that might be a reason, but uh, we didn't find any demographic like differences in terms of the products they were switching to. Again, maybe due to small sample size. So maybe in the future, if there's opportunity with a larger sample size, we will be able to dig into more about who might be switching doing that. Um, yeah, that might be next study. Yeah, and then just to add on to that, um, in the, the study I mentioned, looking at uh, African-American uh, menthol cigarette smokers, uh, or predominantly African-American sample, we had almost no one that said that they were interested in switching to smokeless tobacco. So the, those who said they would switch, they were more interested in, um, in you know, e-cigarettes or um, sometimes little cigars, but not actually smoke. Great. Um, thanks. So the, the other question that we have so far in the Q&A, um, refers to, uh, it's a question about who are the primary manufacturers of flavored cigars? I think this is an interesting question um, and particularly flavored cigars sold in the US. And that could be for either of you. Yeah, sure. We've done some work um, looking at um at you know what kinds of products are available in 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 stores in the U.S. and so one of those studies was in the in the D.C. area and you know some of the flavored cigars that we saw that were pretty high were you know zigzag um, white owl uh, I think these you know these are also ones that are are seen in um, and black and miles and um, and uh, Swisher sweets. So those are kind of the, I think the ones that kind of rise to the top and uh, they have, uh, I haven't really dug into, and I'm sure there's other people here that, that know more about you know, the manufacturers of those products. But uh, my understanding is that, you know, some of the White Owl products are by a Swedish Match company um, and, uh, then, you know, some of the black and mild products are by Middleton. So yeah, it's a variety of manufacturers. Um, so 
I get the sense that, um, yeah, and I don't know if you can answer this from your data, Julia, but I get, this, get the sense that there's a burgeoning market of um, alternative sort of blunt wraps coming on the market um, in, you know, depending on state level cannabis laws, you know, hemp, hemp blunt wraps, things like that. Um, I don't know if you can speak to this in your data, but is there some sort of interest in potentially with a flavored cigar ban switching to non-tobacco type uh, wraps for, you know, continued blunt use? Yeah, that would be a really interesting study. And I know a lot of uh, blunt wraps are actually also come with flavors. So, um, you know, any flavors you can imagine existing in flavored cigars. So there is a possibility they might just, uh, with the flavor band of cigar products, they might just started to use the same flavor with blunt wraps. Um, that's um, something that potentially, um, you know, that might be a response to the flavor band um, in some of the localities right now. Yes. And I wonder, you know, with no real regulation that I know of around, you know, that marketplace, what if you could speak to the, you know, potential public health implications of using, you know, non-standard, non-tobacco wraps and how that might affect equity as well. Shanika, you want to take that question? <laughs> that uh, sure. Like I mean, you know, if you, <laughs> I think there's a whole lot of um, equity issues that are very, very uh, complex uh, around cannabis use. Um, and they're not necessarily the same as the ones that um, are around tobacco use. So I think we just have to be really, you know, um, careful as we, as more states legalize cannabis um, and non-tobacco products are used for cannabis uh, in a legal market because obviously, um, you know, a lot of mass incarceration and, and other social justice impacts have, have occurred inequitably because of um, cannabis, uh, um, you know, because of having effect, uh, because of having Ill illegal cannabis markets. And so, you know, I think we need to just be a, a little bit careful and it's not really about product mix but it's about the overall um you know situation with with cannabis that i think we need to be attentive to great um yeah perhaps it was not so much a question but a point <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a question for both of you, um, and this kind of comes from Dr. Rose's, um, your nice, you know, again, comprehensive uh, overview of the equitable impact on a menthol ban um, or a flavor ban. And, you know, there is that emotional impact that you point out in one of your studies. Um, and I do think that's important, especially regarding to, um, you know, the criminal justice concern, whether it's, you know, found completely or not. Um, how do we provide accurate, you know, evidence-based messaging? You know, I, I think in the, in the past, in the previous uh, discussion, the panel, the previous panel, um, we sort of focused on, hey, you know, this is going to be an issue of enforcement at retail locations more than it is on the individual smokers. But I don't know if that messaging is getting through. Um, so I was wondering if you, either of you had ideas on, you know, how that could be improved or implemented. Yeah, um, you know, I've been having some discussions with different um, localities that have recently implemented or have implemented the past uh, menthol and flavor restrictions. And a number of them are actually moving forward, especially in larger jurisdictions, with making sure that people, um, especially African-American smokers, uh, really understand what is behind um, and counteracting some of the industry messaging that may be uh, occurring around that. Um, trying to have more targeted um, or more tailored cessation intervention uh, messaging in their communities and making sure that, you know, the messages are reaching these communities. So, you know, with bus ads or with, uh, you know, enhanced uh, messaging around their quit lines or, or, or whatever. So, I mean, I don't think that the messages around menthol are, um, you know, they may be different than messages around cessation otherwise, 
Um, but you know, those things I think are being um, actually addressed in a lot of local communities, but maybe the research community is a little bit behind on knowing what practitioners are actually doing on the ground. Um, I wanna add to what Shanika just said about um, a company um, cessation efforts for quitting cigarettes. Um, during our Black Young Adult Cigar Smokers index interviews, we also asked them about their intention and interest in quitting cigars, but um, a lot of participants didn't even know there's anything that can help them quitting cigar products. I'm sure there are a lot of available resources for quitting cigarettes, um, um, but they, they just feel like even with the intention of quitting cigars, they don't know what, what help they can get because they thought a lot of the evidence-based cessation efforts are just for cigarettes. So with the flavor ban, our intention is really trying to motivate people to quit by banning flavors, but how are they going to quit cigars, especially those who are addicted to cigar products, nicotine or cannabis, how are they going to really asking or get help is another um, story or another thing we need to really uh, focus on in the future. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, we do have another question that came in through the Q&A. Um, this is, how would you advise the FDA or a state locality to prohibit flavors in cigars? Um, would you ban all flavors? And is it likely that if we ban menthol in cigarette smokers, they will migrate over to cigars? Um, and follow up is, shouldn't we have equity in regulation of flavors, nicotine, other design features across all combustible tobacco products? Yeah, um, well, I can address that. I, I think they both should be, you know, menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. Uh, all flavors in cigars should be banned and they should be banned at the same time. So for both FDA and for states and localities, I think both of those should be included. In fact, for localities, I think they should go further and you know ban flavors. I know this is a controversial topic, but ban flavors more generally in when they ban menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars and combustibles and flavors more generally in, across tobacco product categories. All right, um, so I do have, let's see, we have one more up there, go to answer. okay. Um, so I was also curious, I'm just kind of, you know, combining, parsing out both of these panel discussions this morning and thought um, Dr. Collier, you know, presents some interesting data. I don't know if you were both in that session, um, you know, that, that suggests that there might be at least some acceptability of, non-menthol cigarettes in menthol users randomized to those conditions. Um, and so we will see a percentage of, you know, menthol users who quit and then a percentage moving over. During this transition time, um, do you see anywhere, you know, specifically that we can intervene um, on any of these areas um, in, in a menthol ban? Um, to sort of, you know, stop that sort of migration to non-menthol non use. Um, is, is there anything more than quit lines or are there targeted interventions that might be in the process? Um, you know, any, any thoughts you have on that would be, I think, of, of uh, great interest. Um. Well, I mean, you know, one thing to keep in mind for uh, mass media campaigns, and they have had, you know, mostly those focused uh, on the real cost on youth prevention, um, and then a little bit with, um, you know, special populations, uh, like for this free life campaign, or for, um, you know, for, uh, other other campaigns, so campaigns with around a menthol ban is something I would highly encourage. Uh, that regulation should a, should take into account what they can do nationally 
um, on the on the communication side. And for states and localities, you know, the same thing. Okay, great. Um, well, that's all the questions uh, I have. And uh, if, if there's any more questions, if you want to put them up here real quick, um, if not, I think this has been a great panel. Um, you know, we have uh, a couple of other sessions coming up today um, that, uh, Nicole, if you want to throw up the, um, yeah, coming up next screen, I can introduce. So um, right after this session, basically in, in three or four minutes here, um, we have the Lunch and Learn presenting, presented by the Center on Rural Addiction. Um, and so the focus there is rural vaping and tobacco use, prevalence considerations and interventions. So you can eat your lunch and learn at the same time. And then uh, afterward at 1.15, there's another paper session. Um, so a couple more great activities here uh, to close out the session today. I wanted to thank Dr. Sankey and Dr. Rose um, for, you know, a, I think a very informative um, and engaging presentations um, on this, you know, impact on this area that that is is highly impactful for public health. So I do appreciate that to both of you. Thank you, Dustin. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thanks.